Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the India Economic Summit's session on skilling, uh, very appropriately termed get up, skill up. Uh, the first get up clearly is designed to make us think that we are perhaps not as awake as we should be on the skilling uh, uh, challenge that India faces. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Shekhar Shah. I'll be the moderator of this session. I'm the head of uh, one of India's largest economic think tanks, NCAR. May I request everybody to turn off their cell phones, please? Just either turn them off or make them silent. And uh, the producers, since they have a ring of cameras around us, have requested that people not get up uh, during the session, otherwise they might be blocking a shot and they don't want that. So two cautions to you, please. I'm delighted to be here and delighted to have a very distinguished panel with me to talk about the challenges India faces in skilling. To my right is Manish Sisodia, Deputy Chief Minister of Delhi, uh, ardent activist, somebody who started his professional life in journalism with ZTV and with All India Radio, and he is passionate about education as the foundation for a just, transparent, and corruption-free society. Yeah, um, I'm also delighted to have Shikhar Sharma, CEO and MD of Access Bank, one of India's leading private sector banks. Uh, she's led the bank since 2009. Prior to that, 30 years, I think, with ICICI, India's largest private sector bank. And she's passionate about the future of jobs in both financial services and how financial services can leverage entrepreneurship, startups, and other ways of creating more jobs in the country. Sergio Piccarelli, uh, on my right, is uh, the head of several different countries, including Italy and parts of Asia and India, of the ADECO Group, the world's largest HR solution provider with experience in over 65 countries, and we are very pleased to have Sergio here. To my left is Anand Narayan, uh, CEO of Mintra.com, India's largest e-commerce platform for fashion and lifestyle products. And to my right, extreme right, is uh, Akshay Kothari, uh, MD of LinkedIn. He is the inventor of Pulse, uh, which he did when he was a student at Stanford in electrical engineering. Um, uh, with a nice buyout by LinkedIn, which now puts him in a very different entrepreneurship space. So I'm absolutely delighted to have this distinguished panel. What I'm going to do is request my colleagues to give me a sense of how India should face up to the challenge. And the challenge, very briefly put, is 250 million young people coming into the labor force in about four to five years. Uh, and uh, uh, we expect to have to generate a million jobs a month for the next 30 years. India will have a working age population of a billion by 2050, which is the world's largest labor force that we have seen, larger than China's. And even in 2100, we will be a workforce of 750 million people. So this is a tremendous opportunity, but also a tremendous challenge because currently we are not equipped to produce the kinds of jobs that can actually productively employ these people. So we have a very large challenge ahead of us, but a tremendous potential to gain the dividend from what we often call the demographic transition in India's population. Most countries in the world that have developed rapidly have done so only when they have made use of this demographic dividend. So with that background and the challenge that we face, I'm going to turn to each of our panelists to give their sense of what are the skills that we need for this future and how are we going to acquire them. Manish Sisodia. Oh, you're starting with me. Thank you. Uh, मैं हिंदी में सोचता हूं तो थोड़ा हिंदी में बात रखने की कोशिश करूंगा मिक्स करके स्किल एंड यू सेड स्किल का फ्यूचर क्या है भारत में सबसे पहले तो हमें सोचना पड़ेगा कि स्किल की हमको हिंदुस्तान में समझ कितनी है अभी हमें प्रॉब्लम क्या है कि स्किल आई एम सॉरी दोस हु कांट अंडरस्टैंड इन हिंदी बिकॉज़ आई थिंक इन हिंदी सो आई ट्राई टू एक्सप्रेस माय सेल्फ मे बी शेखर कैन हेल्प इन समराइजिंग 
हम लोग जब स्किल पे बात करते हैं तो सबसे बड़ी प्रॉब्लम है कि जो बहुत पढ़े लिखे बहुत ज़्यादा स्किल पे बात करने वाले हम सब लोग हैं हम सब लोग कन्फाइंड हैं स्किल मतलब कारपेंटर स्किल मतलब वेल्डिंग और मज़े की बात देखिए कि जब हमने देश में सचिन तेंदुलकर जैसे ब्रांड को यूज़ करके स्किल इंडिया का ऐड बनाया तो हमने क्या ऐड बनाया कौन से स्किल को प्रमोट किया कारपेंटर आई एम नॉट डिफेमिंग और डिमीनिंग एनी थिंग लेकिन अगर हम को अगर हम ये सोचते हैं कि स्किल इंडिया का फ्यूचर है स्किल हमें अपने टेंथ क्लास या ट्वेल्थ क्लास से निकलने वाले हर बच्चे के अंदर कोई ना कोई स्किल डालना है सो वी कॉन्ट आस्क ईच एंड एवरी पेरेंट ऑन दिस इन दिस कंट्री टू सेंड हिज और हर आई मीन सन और डॉटर फॉर बिकमिंग कारपेंटर और अ वेल्डर वो हॉस्पिटलिटी के बिजनेस में भी जा सकता है वो रिटेल के में भी जा सकता है हमें अगर वो अमेजन शॉप जैसा कोई एंटरप्रेनरशिप कर सकता है तो अमेजन डिलीवरी बॉय भी बन सकता है हमें वहाँ उसके उसके उसका पूरा विजन क्लियर करना पड़ेगा अभी एज ए नेशन एज ए सोसाइटी मुझे लगता है कि स्किल को लेके हमारा अपना विजन क्लियर नहीं है हम एक कन्फ्यूज सोसाइटी है स्किल को लेके और उसकी वजह से कभी हम उसको आई बोलते हैं कभी हम उसको पॉलिटेक्निक बोलते हैं कभी हम वोकेशनल बोलते हैं कभी हम सर्टिफिकेट कोर्स बोलते हैं हम टोटलिटी में स्किल नहीं बोलते उसको और वहीं हम फंस गए मुझको लगता है हमें ग्रेजुएशन माने बच्चे जैसे जैसे ग्रेजुअली बड़े होते हैं उनके अंदर जो बड़े हैं उनके अंदर समझना पड़ेगा कि ड्राइविंग भी स्किल है उसको लगता है क्या करना है गाड़ी चलानी आती है जी मैं ड्राइविंग कर सकता हूँ ड्राइविंग एक स्किल है अच्छा कुछ नौकरी नहीं मिल रही सिक्योरिटी गार्ड की दिला दो जी अच्छा किसी दुकान पर नौकरी दिला दो रिटेल शॉप एक स्किल है किसी रेस्टोरेंट में लगवा दो हॉस्पिटलिटी या वेटर के रूप में काम करना एक स्किल है आप बात करो इस कमरे से बाहर निकल के लोगों से वो वेटर का स्किल स्किल क्या होता है जी वो तो वेटर की तो नौकरी है तो वेटर होना एक स्किल हो सकता है आपको हॉस्पिटलिटी के बिजनेस में फाइनेंस और इन सब की तो हम आगे की बात करते हैं बट ये छोटी छोटी चीज़ें स्किल हो सकती हैं इसको लेके हमने क्लैरिटी एज ए नेशन बिल्डअप करने की कोशिश नहीं की और मुझे लगता है उस कम्युनिकेशन की वॉर में हम लोग बहुत पीछे हैं कम्युनिकेशन में बहुत पीछे हैं अभी और जब हम स्किल इंडिया की बात करें स्किल के फ्यूचर की बात करें तो उस पर हमको बहुत जोर दे के बात करनी पड़ेगी और सबको सोचना पड़ेगा इस कमरे में बैठे हुए लोगों से भी मैं बात करूं कि आंख बंद करके सोचिए कि पाँच साल बाद के दस स्किल्स क्या हो सकते हैं जो आज नहीं एग्जिस्ट करते हैं शायद हमें प्रैक्टिस नहीं है सोचने की जब हम स्किल की बात करेंगे तो फिर हम वहीं से शुरू करेंगे वेल्डिंग हम वहीं से शुरू करेंगे जी असेंबलिंग क्योंकि हमने आईटीआई टी उसको उस तरह से ग्रो किया आई नॉट सेंग कि आई की जरूरत नहीं है आज दिल्ली में हम सीमेंस के साथ काम कर रहे हैं मारुति के साथ काम कर रहे हैं लेकिन साथ साथ वर्ल्ड क्लास स्किल सेंटर में खड़े होकर जब मैं अपने ट्वेल्थ क्लास बच्चे को हॉस्पिटलिटी की ट्रेनिंग देता हूं तो वो जाके सिंगापुर में नौकरी करने लगता है वो ऑस्ट्रेलिया में नौकरी करने लगता है उसको दुनिया के अच्छे हॉस्पिटलिटी रिटेल शॉप्स में चेंज में नौकरी मिल रही है वो भी स्किल हो सकता है एक सामान्य मल्टी स्टोर में खड़े होने की नौकरी भी ट्रेनिंग से मिल सकती है ये माइंड में नहीं है और जब तक ये माइंड में नहीं आएगा I don't think we can actually talk about future of the skill in, country, in our country. Mm -hmm. uh, so the only person on the panel who may not have understood Manish fully is Sergio. But since Hindi is so much about uh, using uh, your hands, yeah. and so is Italian, I'm sure you understood every word that he said. Right, but essentially saying that really skills. cannot be thought of just as the traditional ones of welding and carpentry yeah. but we have to think about the new skills the new era the new world in front of us that actually leads us directly into perhaps uh, what's at the forefront in terms of innovation in skilling and that's financial services and shikha what's your take on on this so uh, let me just go back to your starting point on the need for jobs and where jobs might come in the future and where jobs might go away so if we just look at the last 5 years and see what's been happening what we're seeing clearly is that um, agriculture is giving up jobs right mm -hmm. and uh, i think you know as we were saying earlier we shouldn't resist that because we need to improve productivity in agriculture and if we have to do that then we have to see agriculture grow without jobs so how are we going to go and substitute those jobs and where that might come from um i think if we look at the different segments uh manufacturing we we've been 
creating jobs, but at a very slow pace. So relative to GDP growth of manufacturing, job creation has been slower. And uh, I think, you know, if I look forward, then given everything that's happening with robotics and all of that, manufacturing is also likely to become more and more capital intensive and less employment intensive. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think markets are going to become important. And given that India is such a large market, and if 3D printing and some of this stuff comes in, then there can be a case for local-oriented manufacturing, which could end up creating jobs. But uh, with... IT and, you know, where have jobs gotten created in the last five years? I think IT BPO is, has been a big source of job creation. Textiles has been, but has slowed down because some of the export uh, problems that we've had in the textile mm -hmm. sector. Hopefully, with the initiatives that policy has taken, and especially if we get more um, labor flexibility, uh, textiles and leather could actually become a source of growth in the future. Um, IT and BPO... Um, you know, automation is going to come in and take away some of the jobs that ITP, IT and BPO has created in the last few years. But equally, I think it's going to generate a lot more jobs. Because if we look at the future and we say data, machine learning are going to be key themes, then um, India has that basic skill set of data, maths, uh, programming. And we can leverage that to become the next big hub of providing those services globally, provided we have digital infrastructure and we make sure that we are best in class as far as cybersecurity is concerned. So I think those are the two pieces of infrastructure that are needed to make that happen. Uh, the third thing where uh, I think India has a natural advantage, which has probably not been fully tapped yet, has, is tourism, including health tourism. So uh, if we look at the number of tourists India attracts relative to what South Africa attracts or Thailand attracts, I mean, it attracts basically the same number as Thailand, which is surprising given how small that country is and mm -hmm. the kind of tourist destinations we can provide. So what do we need to get that done? I think the government may or may not have articulated it as sharply, but is actually doing a lot of things which can help tourism. So the whole Swachh Bharat, I mean, you need cleanliness. Mm -hmm. You need infrastructure. You need airports, airlines, transportation to make infrastructure happen, uh, to make tourism happen. And uh, on the healthcare front, Again, we do get medical tourism, so we know that there is a case for that, but we don't get enough medical tourism from countries like Japan and Europe, which could be long, large markets for medical tourism, given that they have an aging population and cost of medical delivery is high there. And India has a natural advantage in terms of Ayurveda, yoga, alternate medicine, plus good medical capability. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I think from an opportunity perspective, that is, again, a very large opportunity. So IT, BPU, and uh, tourism, healthcare, I think are large opportunities. And uh, India is doing a bunch of stuff around both of those right now. But maybe a sharper focus to make sure that we focus on jobs there would help. From a banking perspective, we clearly see that um, you know, with data and automation, banking is going to become let, less employment intensive going forward. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've seen that happening in the last few years, and probably We'll see more of that. But on the flip side, um, with digital and data becoming available, the market for financial services can expand dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can get some of what is delivered by the informal sector today can actually come into the formal sector. And when it comes into the formal sector, you have more efficient availability of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, so it grows the market, and it has a secondary impact of promoting entrepreneurship through more efficient capital delivery. So uh, while we b worry about jobs and you know at Access Bank, that's one of the themes that we are looking at. That what is the future of jobs and how might it impact India's growth opportunity? Mm -hmm. We also think that there are lots of silver linings out there. Mm -hmm. As I said, in IT, BPO, tourism, um, data, mm -hmm. uh, financial services, innovation around financial services, local markets. So for every challenge that's out there, there are a bundle of opportunities as well. That's a very optimistic view. And I think you've really touched upon the leveraging possibilities, in particular, as you said, with the market for financial services expanding through more efficient yeah. delivery. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to have so many more startups. And you know, Aadhaar has been a big enabler. And uh, what we can do with Aadhaar and digital can actually 
uh, kick off a lot of innovation, which we so can I then feel, transport to the rest of the world. So I actually had a discussion with Nandan, Nandan yeah. Nilkani, who yeah. used to be the head of the Aadhaar yeah. uh, apparatus uh, when it was launched. He also <laughs> happens to be the president of NCAR, so right. we are very fortunate in having him. But that's exactly the point that he made. But talking about startups, let's go to two individuals who've really been part of that process. I want to turn to uh, Anant Narayanan. Uh, and maybe give us a sense of how the landscape has to change and uh, how should it change. Sure. So, um, you know, I'll touch on the aspect of technology, right? As you just think about the 250 million, you know, the, the folks that are coming in. I think technology is a huge enabler in job creation. Mm. Uh, if you take what we do, which is just e-commerce, mm. e-commerce as an industry didn't really exist, you know, five, seven years ago. It started and now it's at scale. And I think it's just the beginning because I think it transforms how retail operates, right? Mm -hmm. So Mintra, by the way, not only is creating the 2,000 people who are actually the technology-driven folks, but it creates the 8,000 who are the service delivery agents, to your point, right? But what's interesting there is that all of it is technology-enabled. Our service delivery agent today actually operates on an app. He has a mobile phone, smartphones are coming in vogue, right? I think we have 350 million smartphones in India. So he actually operates on a smartphone, learns from a smartphone. So I think technology creates jobs. That's one example. The other is, by the way, just the seller ecosystem that Flipkart and Amazon have created. There are so many sellers now mm -hmm. that actually have no access. And it provides access and distribution and an ability for small businesses to scale. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the second type of job creation. Uh, so I think if I take the next five, seven, ten year view, I think entire industries and jobs will get created. I think using technology as an enabler. I think there are many examples, Uber, Ola, Flipkart, right? All of these will create large number of jobs and there are large number of secondary jobs. So if you just take Mintra, um, not only are we creating direct jobs, we are also creating manufacturing jobs because 20% of what we do is private label. Mm -hmm. And that, by the way, has a lot of manufacturing associated with it and all of that is made locally, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot of manufacturing that actually also, as, as commerce and retail increase, there's a lot of secondary job creation that happens uh, in services as well as in manufacturing. But all of it happened differently. Now, that's the nearer term view. If I take a 10-year view, however, I think technology will change how we perceive and do our jobs. I think machine learning, AI, all will become much more standard. I'll give you an example. Uh, today, if you take either the buying function in retail or if you take the job of a designer, designing a set of clothes, now that's changing. Right? So in Mintra, by the way, we are now using machine algorithms to say what a t-shirt should be right? or what a pair of jeans should be. Now, that's actually, by the way, changing what a role of a designer is. Therefore, I think as you think about skills, it's important to say, you know, are we actually imbibing learnability? Because I think over a period of a career, you know, things will change dramatically for you and you can't predict it. So what you have to imbibe in schools, in colleges, is a measure of learnability, saying are you actually teaching learnability? And I think that's an important aspect of it. Uh, the second is just, I think, um, what the machine learning can't take away, I think, is a combination of EQ, people skills, and the ability to logically derive insights from data. So are we doing enough of that in our schools to teach people and upskill them? Right. So two points. One is, I think, lots of job creation through technology and new industries getting created. Second is, given the uncertainty of it and the fact that machine learning and AI will go become big, how do you change the skills around learnability mm. is the other aspect. Mm. The mm. third, just last point I'll make is, um, you know, the average age of a Mintra employee is 24 <laughs> to 25, right? They don't think of jobs as careers. I mean, just, the, the word career, just uh, it's like a jungle gym as opposed to a career ladder, right? So, you know, um, a, and people think of life in one and a half year terms, right? Uh, not in five year, 10 year terms, right? I think one interesting factoid is the average tenure of a company is half in a, of an employee in a company is half the age of a company. So if you have a four-year-old company, you only have a two-year sort of view to that career, right? So you have to think very differently about how you skill them. Mm. Um, they don't learn in classrooms. They learn much more digitally. They learn much more on an as-needed basis. Mm -hmm. So all of our learning is on an app, mm. right, where we actually drip feed people what's actually required. There's a lot more interactive things that actually happen. And this, by the way, is not at the higher end. It's actually at our service delivery agents. Our mm. service delivery agents training programs every day get through apps. So you actually have, you don't take them out of the job, but you, you do it Train very differently. The job. Right? So I think just learnability of this group of people, the millennials, will be very different. 
And therefore, as all of, for all of us, I think we have to think deeply about how do we actually train them. Mm. And that part will also be very technology enabled, mm. in my view. So these are very, very useful thoughts because I think the learnability is directly tied to employability, uh, which is where the big gap currently exists. Yeah. Firms can't get the right kinds of young people to join them. The young people can't find the jobs that they are trained for. Let me turn to Sergio and ask uh, for his sense of India's challenges from his global perspective. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think that this is a, a nice challenge. If I see what is happening in Europe, where uh, the main issue is, uh, is the aging of population and uh, is the opposite problem, uh, is, is a really nice um, challenge because we are speaking about young generation, we are speaking about the future. Our role as uh, stakeholders in this kind of uh, opportunity is to play the right role in this kind of game. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I speak about stakeholders, I speak about company, institution, schools, and government. Uh, the market needs uh, flexibility and the candidates needs employability. These are the two key points. The employability depends on the fact that school are, has to be more integrated with the labor market, as you say. Um, the distance today, and this is not related just to India, this is uh, everywhere the same point, the distance between the schools, the, the education, and the labor market is becoming bigger. And with this, uh, uh, exactly what you say, in the next 10 years, probably there will be 60% of the job that uh, we don't know mm. today what mm. will be. And the development of the digital is a clear example. Three years ago, uh, five years ago, probably uh, uh, automotive engineers was looking for a job in a, in a car company. Mm. Today, the main competitor of car company uh, is Google, you know, and, and this is the reality. So the employability is a key fact for granting to the young generation the future. And uh, we have to play the role as a company, as school. More collaboration, more clarity, more understanding of what is happening in the labor market from all these stakeholders. The other point is the flexibility. The competitiveness of India today is mainly based on the cost of the labor market. But if we see the history of the, all the big development, and when I speak big development, I'm not speaking about the size of the big development in India, but other experience. And uh, we come back to 25 years ago, what's happening in Eastern Europe, for example. Again, smaller dimension respect to India, but the same, the same concept was that all the companies were moving there for the cost of the labor. But the cost of the labor, by definition, will increase. So the flexibility is the right point for granting competitiveness of the company and of the countries. And how we can work on this, this is part of the government to grant flexibility. And when I speak about flexibility, being part of uh, the major uh, staffing company in the world, I'm not speaking about uh, uh, only the opportunity to, for company to be flexible in terms of workforce, but to grant equal treatment of payment for the salary of the flexible workforce. Mm -hmm. We are um, uh, working in all the countries for having the equal treatment of salary for the flex flexible workforce and the permanent person. So what we call in, a, in, a, in Italy was the flex security, flexibility mm -hmm. for companies, security for people and for the workers. This point is the key point. The other point that is uh, important related to the development and the, uh, for, for candidates is related to the training, to the skill up, okay? How we can skill up. And again, all the stakeholders can play a key role in this, in this, uh, in this sector. As an example, in, um, in Italy, in most of the European countries, the government, uh, when it was regulating the, flex, the flexible workforce and the labor market, was uh, obliging company like ADECO to spend uh, a percentage of the salary of the people in training, mm. okay? Not keeping the salary from the people, but adding to the salary a training. And this is a mandatory part. Just for, for give you an idea, in the last five years, ADECO invest more than 645 millions in training for skilling up our associate. 
clearly we have a, a we are a private company we mm -hmm. have a, an objective for doing that mm -hmm. but we are helping to skill up the the, the candidates mm -hmm. and to grant more employability to that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so these are uh, the key words. The other point that could be interesting is uh, related to the black market, the black labor market or gray labor market, that is a, a real competitor for granting competitiveness uh, in, in, uh, in the countries. You know, mm -hmm. company, they like to have very transparent and, uh, and, uh, and uh, clear labor legislation. And um, company like ADECO, staffing companies, all the sector is granting to clean up this, this kind of uh, potential risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other point, just for giving you an example, in India we have 100,000 associate uh, workers every day that we delegate in our client, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we don't pay these people through check or cash. We are just paying through bank accounts, so we are opening bank accounts. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And when you open bank account, technically you can track everything. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, a, the, the role that we play for uh, for uh, for helping the employability and sure. the the security of the workers. Sure, well, that's a very useful perspective, flexibility as well as employability, and the narrowing the gap between the school and the workforce. Akshay, um, as I think you are the youngest on this panel, uh, but obviously with a lot of punch uh, in having uh, got to where you have to either your personal experience or LinkedIn being one of the world's largest platforms for the meeting place of skills and jobs. What's your take? Yeah, so a lot of really amazing things have been covered. I'll, um, I'll start with the personal story, I think. So, so I, I was born and brought up in Ahmedabad and I left uh, about 13 years ago uh, to go to the US to study, to kind of pursue my college education. And I just moved back this year um, to, to head LinkedIn in India. And, and because I was gone for so long, uh, I, I, I figured it would be a good opportunity to just reconnect with the country because I was starting to build products for India. I decided to kind of go on a trip across India and the team decided to do a research trip. You know, we went to Nasik in the, in the west, we went to Meerut, not too far from here. We went to Durgapur in the east, and we went to Devangar in the south. And the idea was to just go out there and meet college students. Um, and it wasn't to, to convince them to join LinkedIn. It was just to go out there and observe and experience um, how they lived, what, you know, what kind of, how they spent their time in colleges, and how they got their first job. And uh, you know, as I was talking to these college students, I, I, to me, like, it felt like a Swadesh movie-like moment I where I truly understood the gravity of the problem this country faces. Mm. Um, a lot of these college students have spent all of their family's fortunes of, for getting a college degree, uh, but are now struggling to get a job. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the thing is, it's, it's not just them, it's not just the college students I met. India is producing 8 million college graduates every year, mm -hmm. and there's been studies which have shown that more than half of them are unemployable. Mm -hmm. And so I think to me, like, I think that was uh, an eye-opener. And I think if you extend that to some of the new programs we've launched with Skills India, I think although it's a step in the right direction, I think if you actually talk to all the people who got skilled, I think most of them will tell you that they're actually having a tough problem getting a gig or getting an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then it's the people in this room, like we all actually have a job. And there's a study that came out this week that said, you know, the World Bank report said that 69% of jobs in India are threatened by automation. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sorry to start this morning on an ominous note, but we have a problem where college students are getting a college degree, but not getting a job. Um, people are getting skilled, but not getting a gig. And then people who actually have jobs are now threatened by automation. Mm. Um, having said that, there have been some really encouraging things I've seen in the last couple of months. So I think kind of building on what Anand was saying in terms of technology, I think we built a platform that we launched about three weeks ago called Placements. And the whole idea of Placements was to really democratize opportunity for all college students in India. And so the idea is that it's an online assessment test uh, that people can take uh, on Placements. And whether you're a college student in IIT Delhi or whether you're a college student in the most interior parts of India in, in, in Bihar or Assam or wherever, mm. Um, you can take the same standardized test, and that test connects you to thousands of openings that exist uh, f in companies like Samsung, uh, Amazon, um, HCL, and a bunch of others, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so in three weeks, we've gotten two and a half lakhs uh, applications. And I can't wait for the next couple of weeks to find out like some of the people who live in the remote parts of India actually getting the best jobs that are available in this country, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one. Secondly, I think we're, we're now actually engaging in a very meaningful dialogue with the government because LinkedIn actually sees, you know, on a, on a daily basis, LinkedIn India has about half a million active jobs. So we actually have a pretty good view of where the demand side looks like, where the jobs exist. And so we can really help the governments, you know, city, gov city governments or state governments, really help figure out for that state, you know, how should they be thinking about skilling their people? Where mm -hmm. are the jobs for that state? Mm -hmm. uh, and how can they be uh, figuring out that the skilling program is, is in the right direction, to, to Manisha's point as well? Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, I think like, you know, the, the most amazing thing that's happening in this country is that more and more people are actually have uh, broadband internet connection on their fingertips. Um, and so the idea that you can now access learning content uh, wherever you are, um, you know, LinkedIn has a learning program with uh, the acquisition of Linda, but actually there's some amazing platforms like Coursera, Udacity, uh, that people can really tap into and really be thinking about upskilling every day so that they're prepared for future jobs is, is, is going to be a, a game changer, right? So in summary, I think to me, like, I think the college degree is not an end. I think skilling is also not an end. I think these are all means to an opportunity where people can have stable jobs. Mm -hmm. And so if, imagine a world where, um, I think as, uh, you know, imagine a world where companies are working closely with the colleges and vocational institutes to, to really drive a curriculum that can help them actually employ the right people. I think that can truly transform the Indian economy. And that's kind of what we're focused on as well. I'm just pausing to think about the, the potential that you've laid out for digital, not just getting out, crowding out jobs, but transforming the way in which young people relate to the workforce and to employment opportunities. And it goes to Anand's point about learnability, that if in schools we can actually build that kind of learnability rather than learning by rote and passing to curriculum uh, uh, requirements, then we have an agile workforce that is able precisely to take advantage of the opportunities that we've been talking about. Manish, I'm going to go back to you for just a minute and ask in particular, how is Delhi government thinking about these kinds of opportunities? I think uh, in last one and a half year, I have been trying to focus on learnability mm -hmm. because many times I find that we teach and just teach. We don't make them learn. Yeah. Sometimes we make them learn, but just make them learn. There is no learnability because it's an entirely different skill that we need in every, every human being. And that's why we are lacking in our schools, in uh, our skills uh, training centers, engineering centers, everywhere, and in our policies as a leader, if I say. Um, I was just thinking while hearing them that very common skill that's needed around us is uh, puja paatka skill. Everybody needs, hum sab log, kam se kam Hindustan mein is tarah ke jeete hain ki humare agar naukri mein pehli naukri ke baad motorcycle leta hai ladka, uske liye bhi ek pandit chahiye uska shuruat karne ke liye. But, and there are schools and colleges who are offering these courses these days, mm -hmm. Vedic colleges, and there are certain universities are there, Maharishi universities, and some Hardwar universities are offering courses in there. Fantastic. But what's the problem? Learning, either teaching or learning is there, some part of learning, but learnability is not there. Mm -hmm. I met, I, I heard some of the pandits are now being more innovative mm -hmm. based on their learnability. क्योंकि दिल्ली जैसे शहर में अब आप अपने घर में हवन कुंड नहीं रखते हो आपको पता नहीं दूध घास कहां से मिलेगी आपको कच्चा दूध कहां से मिलेगा सो दे ऑफर द पैकेज आई हर्ड वेल कमिंग हियर आई हर्ड अबाउट अ पंडित जी हु ऑफर्स द स्पेस आल्सो बोले आपको अपना घर गंदा करने की जरूरत नहीं है मैं 20 25 लोगों का हवन अपने ही करा दूंगा एक संस्कार अपने ही करा दूंगा दिस इज द लर्नेबिलिटी बिकॉज़ एक बड़ी चीज जो सब लोगों से मुझे निकल के समझ में आई आई वाज जस्ट आई नोटेड इट कि अभी हम मार्केट और हम जब जॉब्स की बात करते हैं स्किल ट्रेनिंग की बात करते हैं वी टॉक अबाउट मार्केट हमारे इस थिंकिंग uh, पैटर्न से सोसाइटी गायब है बिकॉज hmm. नीड तो सोसाइटी में आज बच्चा पढ़ना चाहता है फैमिली बाहर जाना चाहती है तो घिस घिस करके मार्केटिंग की जगह घूमना चाहती है तो हेयर हेयर द कंपनी जो उसको कहती है अच्छा तुम घूमो एन्जॉय करो हम आपको डेली नीड्स जो है घर डिलीवर करा देंगे सो दिस इज अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ सोसाइटी इट्स नॉट मार्केट इट्स सोसाइटी आप सोसाइटी को समझ रहे हैं उसकी जरूरत को समझ रहे हैं उसमें से जॉब क्रिएट कर रहे हैं 
उसमें से जॉब निकालने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं मैं एक छोटा सा डेटा आपके सामने रखना चाहता हूँ बिकॉज अभी हमारी सारी बातचीत एक एक एक्सट्रीम से शुरू होती है जॉब्स मार्केट फ्यूचर स्किल का फ्यूचर क्या है एक दूसरा मैं आपके सामने डेटा के साथ रखना चाहता हूँ दिल्ली के स्कूल से आई थिंक यू गेव सम फिगर अबाउट नेशनल दिल्ली के स्कूल से हर साल ढाई लाख बच्चे पास आउट होते हैं स्कूल से ओनली स्कूल्स और उन ढाई लाख बच्चों में से जब हम उनसे बात करते हैं आपको कहाँ जाना है एवरीबडी वॉन्ट एडमिशन इन डी और डी टी यू और आई टी आई आई मीन आई आई टी एंड ऑल बिग शॉर्ट्स इंस्टीट्यूट्स उसके बाद इन सारा मिला के हमारे पास में एक लाख दस हज़ार की सीट्स हैं इन टेक सारा मिला के इंक्लूडिंग माई आई टी आईज एंड ऑल अब बाकी के एक लाख चालीस हज़ार बच्चों को कहाँ लेके जाऊँ उनको हम कोई ट्रेनिंग दे देंगे इन लास्ट आई वाइंड अप इन वन ऑफ द एग्जाम्पल उनको कहीं भेज देते हैं कोई छोटी मोटी शकरपुर में ट्रेनिंग के लिए भेज दिया कहीं भेज दिया मैं एक अपनी आईटीआई में ट्रेनिंग के लिए गया विजिट के लिए गया वहाँ आई फाउंड वेरी यंग एनर्जेटिक गाइस असेंबलिंग एलईडी बल्ब्स विद फुल कॉन्फिडेंस हम इतना कर सकते हैं दिन में इतना प्रोडक्शन कर सकते हैं आई सेट व्हाट आर यू डूइंग विद दैट हमने सब बस ओपन किया हुआ है एनीबडी कैन कम एंड बायस और हमारी गारंटी है कि कोई हम खराब हो जाएगा तो हम वापस यहाँ से रिप्लेस कर देंगे सो आई सेट दिवाली इज नेक्स्ट डोर वाई डोंट यू आई मीन मार्केट इट सो दैट एलिमेंट ऑफ वैल्यू एडिशन जो मैंने पंडित के एग्जाम्पल में बोला जो आई टी का वैल्यू एडिशन नहीं है हम अगर कोई स्किल सिखा रहे हैं तो स्किल सिखा के छोड़ दे रहे हैं उसका वैल्यू एडिशन कैसे करना है उसमें और सोसाइटी से कैसे जोड़ना है वो लिंक खत्म हो जाता है वो लर्नेबिलिटी है उसको अगर हम किसी तरह से इंश्योर कर लें एंड वी आर ट्राइंग टू डू इट एक्सलेंट बिफोर आई ओपन इट आप एंड आई वॉन्ट वेरी मच ओपन इट आप टू दियंस एंड आई जस्ट डू दैट इन अट बट गोइंग बैक आनंद टू द काइंड ऑफ एप्लीकेशन यू बर टॉकिंग अबाउट एंड दैट अक्षय ऑल्सो वॉज रिफरिंग टू दैट विल नैरो द डिस्टेंस बिटवीन द स्कूल एंड द वर्क प्लेस एंड लीड टू कंटिन्यूस लाइफ लॉन्ग लर्निंग are we doing enough are we investing enough what is the ecosystem what's the policy framework that can promote that so um i think clearly there is a lot more to do i don't think we're doing enough my sense by the way is i think if you just think about education itself i think you already touched on learnability i think education and thinking of a formal college degree i think in 10 years from now will not be how we think about it right i think it's a set of what skills have you actually learned and what skills will you continue to learn the base infrastructure without any help from any anybody else just because of technology exists which is the 350 million smartphones and the broadband access actually that you were talking about i think what we need is to encourage more entrepreneurship and ideas around people who can create real businesses around it i think you need a policy framework for it you basically need to say how do i create companies that actually take education as a business mm. and create very efficient lifelong learning because i think you know getting innovation and business and market and capital in there is is needed mm. that part i think there's so much more to do right um and i think it has to be done in local languages it has to be able to reach every part of india i think there is a lot there's a market there mm. the base infrastructure unlike you know physical infrastructure it's digital infrastructure that star- is exists right aadhar now i think will be another big enabler of it yes. so i think the the building blocks exist what is needed is a framework on top and actually people investing capital and there's a policy framework on top that actually allows this industry to be built mm. i think the next 5 years will be critical if you build this industry i think you'll solve a lot of learnability problems mm. right mm. in terms of how you upskill and you upskill a large number of people right shikha crucial role of finance in this as an enabler and your ability and your uh, uh, banking sector's ability to make this kind of venture capital available even in small drips and drabs that can allow this kind of entrepreneurship any thoughts on that so i just want to talk about two things that we at access bank are trying to do one uh, you know we talked about i really like the story that akshay was telling around uh, his travel around the I country i did too especially and, from a fellow gujarati yeah <laughs> uh, so you know i joined the bank in 2009 and um, one of the things that access had done was we had a foundation well before csr became fashion it was set up in 2006 and we were contributing 1% of our profits towards uh, csr activities and at that time the focus of our csr was around education and uh, what hit me at that point of time was that a lot of these guys got educated and um, after that they didn't get jobs so we were actually adding to frustration because mm. we ha- we were increasing the pool of educated unemployed so we changed the focus of what the foundation was 
yeah. going to impact. And we moved from education to livelihoods. And we took a goal that we want to catalyze a million livelihoods in a five-year period. And at that point of time, we didn't have an idea of how we were going to do that or what we were going to do. But over the last four or five years, we've run a lot of little pilots with NGOs. So we don't do it directly, but we work with NGOs who work in that field. And you know, the outcome of that has been very interesting because we are seeing lots of different things which have had an impact, created livelihoods, increased incomes for people. And again, the goal we had taken was the people we impact we should measure what their income was before the uh, program started and what their income was two years later. So was mm. there a sustainable impact on income? Mm. Mm. And uh, there are some agricultural type stuff which is done very well. There is crafts kind of stuff which is done very well. And there is uh, some uh, skilling. you know, sure. So the welding, carpentry, construction, driving, those kinds of skills. So we've actually found there are different programs that have worked. There are some programs which have worked around water conservation and agricultural productivity. There are other programs which have worked around some of the mass low-end skills. So this is one area where I think, you know, we really, it brings up a very important yeah. point. We need to be piloting a lot of different things. Exactly. And rather than rushing to scale, we need to actually learn from some exactly. of these Exactly. So what we like about that program is that we went about scientifically measuring, measuring. impact exactly. and seeing we'll run 30 programs, but we will scale the 10 which have maximum impact. The other interesting story I want to just spend a minute on is uh, microfinance. Mm. So uh, as banks, you know, we don't think of banks doing microfinance. But uh, again, we went into microfinance about three years ago. And Aadhaar and technology has allowed a bank like us to get into it, which otherwise would have been very difficult from a region cost perspective. And uh, I went recently, after we had run this stuff for one and a half years, to one of the earliest places that we started microfinance. And the initial round of funding we do is just about 18,000 rupees. That's not a lot of money. And then depending upon how the person is done with that first round of 18,000 rupees, then the next time they can be qualified to get 30,000 rupees. And some of the stories there were amazing stories. So there's a woman who had taken a loan of 18,000 uh, 18 months ago. And um, she started with just sending, setting up a village shop. And that village shop did well. And then she set up a sewing machine to start to do sewing, because that was the other need of the village. And then with that, she started doing tailoring classes. And then she said, oh, you know, lots of marriages and people are getting aspirational. So she started a beauty parlor. And today, she earns 35,000 rupees a month. So really and this was within 18,000. So, And she's graduated into mm -hmm. becoming the next higher level of borrower. Mm -hmm. What it's done is not just graduated her, but she's a role model then for, for the, the village and the uh, villages around. Sure. And there are lots of other women who want to come and, you know, follow that. Mm. So I liked what Mr. Sisodia was saying, that look, one of the ways to change society is, are we creating the right role models? So how do we go out there and change some of this issue around learnability, entrepreneurship? Can we just create a whole lot of new role models? Lots of people say, how has ICSA brought so many women into financial services. You have one or two role models and then a lot of others follow through. So I think just put out there the 10, 15 role models based on what we think are going to be the jobs Works, of the future yeah. and the entrepreneurship capabilities of the future. And the other thing I liked about what uh, Akshay said was democratize opportunities. I think that helps us to take advantage of our demographic dividend, which can otherwise become a curse. So okay. uh, if we have those people, we have to make sure we marry them well to the options. Actually, hold your horses just now, because I want to bring the audience in. I think it's high time we actually engage with them. They've been sitting patiently, and I have so many hands up. So uh, the rules of the game. Uh, uh, no long-winded comments. Please just, you know, very quick, please identify yourself. I don't know if you need microphones or if they have other kinds of uh, apparatus in the in the room. I'm going to start with this uh, gentleman here on my uh, extreme right. And and less than a minute, please. Yeah, my name is Devendra Jani. I'm a global shaper. Um, traditionally in India, kids at the age of six or seven knew how to do uh, work with their parents doing the same, uh, how a furnace works as a goldsmith, do welding and stuff. But our Indian education today, which is a copy of the Western education, completely drains your mind till you are 17 or 18. Don't teach you any skill, teaches you how to sit and do a job. And then they have a very big question, what I do after my 10th grade because I haven't acquired any skill. Um, 
And unfortunately, uh, it's a mindset that you're only supposed to acquire skill if you score less in your 10th grade or you're supposed to do all the carpentry and our other stuff, only if you don't study well. Can we have in our education curriculum skill building at the very age when the kids get into school so that they know what are the options right from the uh, early age as well as the skill building starts while they have the learning capabilities in their initial age? Okay. All right. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm geographically um, uh, <laughs> correct. Uh, but let me start with the lady on the extreme. Uh, Oh, I see. Do you count yourselves amongst them? I see. <laughs> Please, I'll come to you in a second. So I'm Renu. I, I head uh, Gruha in India, which is uh, a bathroom fittings company. Our biggest challenge is around plumbing, uh, because I relate to what you said. Very briefly, you know, we were, we've been talking about demand and supply gap. We're talking about digital disruption. We're talking about placements. So we are assuming the, a basic level of education, and we are also assuming that people are digitally savvy. I'm talking of a shorter term, let's say a decade from now. And then, uh, you know, and they will get onto platforms, they will recognize this. From my point of view, education to entrepreneurship is what India should only work on. So all our Skill India initiatives should be around that. Carpentry, plumbing, puja, whatever. I mean, I mean, it has to give those thoughts so I'm just adding on so you can answer together, that what are we doing to ensure that each child learns as he goes along and then he or she makes a choice later about a profession which may not be a job at a corporate. It can be an entrepreneurship, an aggregator, a vendor, a, a papar, you know, industry, a sewing machine, whatever. So we, and we regard these professions as equitable and respectful. I think that's a societal change we need to do. Thank you very much. I think it's a very profound thought. The gentleman here in the center, please identify yourself. I'm glad. I was going to say that we should all introduce ourselves. I'm Madhur Bajaj, I'm Vice Chairman of Bajaj Auto. Uh, just like in business, uh, we decide our capacity building, uh, how many vehicles to make, etc., based on the demand. And we take into consideration segments where we are not, so we're going to make a new model. So we create that much more capacity. Similarly, why can't we have an integrated package mm -hmm. where we say that, OK, where will the demand either come from, be created, it's there? Tourism, for example, is a new demand create, a job creator. As many foreign tourists come here which visit Eiffel Tower, <laughs> 8 million, OK. I mean, there's tremendous. Uh, potential. Once you have those figures, and not only in India, I'm talking about global, and if a country requires people and we have the skills, believe me, the visa regime will uh, be nothing. I mean, they will see that the visa regime does not stop people from going there to get those jobs. Then have the skilling based on the demand which we feel is going to be there in the future. So it's, it's a complicated thing. It's not an easy thing because You've got to think futuristic as to where will the demand come from, how can we create those extra demands, etc., and how do we prepare skilling by way of the right teachers mm -hmm. who can do the skilling mm -hmm. so that, therefore, we have a complete package. Okay. Gentlemen here. Thank you. It's a very interesting conversation. I'm, I'm Ben Penny with Johnson Controls. Construction trades have come up a couple of times, and... A hidden part of China's sustained growth over the past 20 years has been the management of the absorption of a very large tens and tens of millions of people from surplus agricultural labor into semi-skilled construction trades. And as a part of that, the management of that very large itinerant workforce. And that has required, you know, we talk about agility a lot in relationship to information technology, uh, managing a different kind of agility in the labor force. I'd, I would love to hear how folks think about infrastructure building as a key driver of jobs and social stability. No, I'm, I'm very glad you brought that up because clearly we have a huge infrastructure deficit. And you mentioned Swachh Bharat. I, I don't know, one of you mentioned Swachh Bharat. There's, you know, it creates a public good 
in clean urban cities, but it creates huge employment. And you could have vacuuming machines do the same, but I think we can avoid that level of capitalization. So I think that's a very important point. In China, um, from my understanding, at the eighth grade, students make a choice between formal, completing their formal education or going to vocational. 50% of students choose the vocational. We need to change our thinking. Gentlemen here in the front. We'll come back at the end and have a final round of uh, contributions from you. Sudhir from Thomson Reuters. I just want to make a point uh, on the policy making side uh, when we are building programs like Skill India and this, I hope we have stakeholders like this, part of the ecosystem, who are engaged in policy making, who are engaged in developing these programs, because I'm not too sure if that is the case. Because that itself otherwise is a huge gap that what we are building and what for. Because we are building for 15 years, 20 years, 25 years from now. Mm -hmm. So are we having right stakeholders? I'm not too sure. So I'm putting my perspective in the policy making. We need, I think, stakeholders like this well, uh, through an appropriate platform. Thank you. Mr. Sisodia can appoint all of us to his skilling task force for them. All are welcome. <laughs> Let's work together. <laughs> OK, uh, lady here has been waiting very patiently. Just wait for the microphone, please. You're on camera. Uh, Shalini Pillay from KPMG. And uh, some great points today in terms of learnability and agility. Uh, but I'd like to touch upon, since we have a large part of corporate India sitting here, and we're talking of imbibing learnability at early stages, if we could also touch upon agility that we're seeing in the corporate world. Because today, we still recruit to jobs. We still recruit for job descriptions and roles. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are we doing about agility and openness in terms of flexibility when we are reviewing and assessing talent uh, and not really insisting on fitments to roles and boxes and job descriptions? Mm -hmm. Because there's an onus on corporate India to allow for this flexibility and mm -hmm. employability mm -hmm. if we are, are more agile and open in the way one is looking at it. So I'd love to hear some thoughts from the corporate side as well. No, that's a very important point. Um, so we are going to probably have to wind up in about five minutes, and I have a real choice between letting my panelists come back and cater to the many large number of hands I still see up. I'm going to turn to the gentleman in the far back because uh, I need to make sure that we cover everybody. I'll then see if we can have five minutes with the panel. Yes, please. Hi, everyone. And please keep it short. I represent Manpower Group, one of the largest employers in India. Uh, right now, from contract staffing as well as permanent. We see, we've been seeing a lot of skill gaps in the last 10 years I've been with this organization. But uh, recently we have done some things which I wanted to highlight to you guys. We, one thing is a short-term perspective of getting people to jobs, and the second is to have a long-term perspective. Short-term, we need to understand, we, I addressed NSTC a few days back, and National, we had a national type, skill development. Yes, council. yes, yeah, and we and we also understood that whatever, whatever trainings we are doing are really not uh, the right, uh, you know, kind of creating the skill sets to the jobs in demand that we see. So we we proposed uh, some short-term skilling initiatives, which we have recently done in Bangalore. We have established our own skilling academy there, in collaboration with the university. You will not believe me. Ninety-seven percent success rate and 1,000 kids on the job in four months, full-time employment with us, Fantastic. and 55% diversity. This we did with a client-committed approach. As I heard some of the friends from uh, Corporate India, they, are all, they all know what they want. And if, you, if they all, as I said, in the policy making, they're all together, and they give the demands to all the people, I think that'll be a great thing to do. Thank you very much. I'm now going to have to cut out the questions from the audience. I'm so sorry I have to do that, but I think we have to give our panelists. So I'm going to go back in reverse order and start with Akshay. About just... Well, you've heard a lot of questions. You wanted to There's come in. There's a lot of interesting ideas. <laughs> um, so I Pick think, one. I think um, you know, I really kind of resonated with the idea of you know, teaching entrepreneurship. As, as, as one of the things. And so I think when we think about skills, we think a lot about like hard skills, like you know, whether it's carpenter, uh, carpenter or, or, um, or maybe like learning how to do accounting and so on. I don't think we spend as much time thinking about soft skills. You know, I think one of the things I noticed when I was on the field is that 
and you can you can actually get someone to like let's say program really well uh, but that same person when he's actually he or she's actually interviewing with candidates he may actually not get the job because he's not able to kind of have those soft skills to actually complete mm-hmm. it right and mm-hmm. so and so the idea that that you we can also we have to think a lot about what kind of soft skills we're providing uh, or we're teaching um, and one of the kind of more radical ideas that i think that i think you know think about a world where we can actually teach our kids compassion mm. uh, and empathy at a very early age uh, so that they can actually see what kind of problems exist and they kind of want to go out and actually solve those problems excellent thought so you uh, very I, quickly i i really appreciate all the comments around and i think that uh, um, if we can summarize you know it's important and uh, india is doing a, a lot of investment in infrastructure and i agree with you we need all the infrastructure f- for developing the countries but in the same time we have to invest in human capital mm. you know we, we only the infrastructure can not uh, uh, sustain the development we need people mm. we need the right talent mm-hmm. and uh, i agree with uh, with uh, with you when uh, the selection of people most of the selection of people is coming from the attitude of the people so on the soft skills and not on the hard skills so even as a positive message for the young population they have to be prepared but even uh, is not enough to be prepared but is important to be ready and flexible in front of the le- the labor uh, opportunities and then just a quick word i'll stick with learnability learnability is a skill Uh, in Mintra, at least, we have a way of assessing people on learnability based mm-hmm. on experience, based mm-hmm. on ideas that they've had. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it's a framework. You can both assess it and you can develop Deploy. it. So I think you need to do that at scale. Shikha. So I'm going to have two uh, that I uh, want to talk about. One is it's important for us to have a blueprint of uh, where jobs will come uh, 10, 15 years, maybe 15 years from now, and be very clear about where those jobs are. You know, whether it's tourism or or whatever else comes up or uh, construction the second thing we then need to do is marry that marketplace of where jobs will come from to the education system i think our education system puts too much load on children today and too much load in terms of rote and memory mm-hmm. and too little emphasis on practical so i would actually reduce the curriculum uh, in in schools starting from the 10th standard onwards dramatically and instead substitute it with saying you have to go out there and do summer trainings you have to start doing summer trainings from 8th standard onwards so that you get exposed to different uh, skill areas and you figure out you know between that 10th and 12th standard what you really want to do so practically you change the orientation from road and memory uh, to learnability to learnability and application okay last word manish <laughs> great uh, just to inform you कि हमने दिल्ली के स्कूल्स में 25 परसेंट सिलेबस क्लास एट तक कम कर दिया है एंड सी बी एस सी से वी आर स्ट्रगलिंग विद कि भैया हमारी बात मान लो कम से कम हमें दिल्ली में करने दो बाकी जगह के लिए आप करते रहो हम लोग uh, अगले साल से प्रोबेबली वी आर स्टार्टिंग अप विद न्यू स्किल यूनिवर्सिटी एंड इसमें आई एम फोकसिंग ऑन वन हैंड डिफरेंट स्किल्स न्यू स्किल्स एंड रिसर्च ऑन स्किल्स बट सैम टू आई एम फोकसिंग ऑन training of trainers also because mm-hmm. that's a biggest bigger problem and uh, i experienced this while doc- i met dr kalam late dr kalam and with some of my officers and he said aapko do certificate dene chahiye that was his famous line so i said sir yes to my secretary and some of my officers in education department were there and they said sir hum to de rahe hain 200 schools mein humne vocational courses shuru kiye hue so i was a new minister that time i said i was not aware hum kya kar rahe hain kya nahi kar rahe itna so i said fine i'll check it so one fine day i went to a school uh, i'm infamous for my surprise visits in my schools <laughs> but still wahan ja ke maine dekha occasionally main class mein gaya wahan pe tourism padhaya ja raha tha 11th class uh, 12th class mein aur wo tourism 11th mein bhi padhaya gaya tha to maine aise bachcho se pucha kya padhaya bachcho to everybody took out the notebook panch sat pages definitions ke holiday tourism kya hota hai package tourism kya hota hai sab kuch likha hua tha maine pucha aapko kabhi leke jate hain bahar ha ha ek bar bus mein leke jate hain kutub minar dikhane leke gaye the so kutub minar dikhane se tourism sikh sakta hai tourism industry ka koi aadmi aata hai kya kuch matlab abhi hame pata hi nahi hai ki tourism padhana kaise hai aur hum formality ke naam pe apne 200 schools mein maybe 50 schools mein tourism padha rahe hain beauty padha rahe hain aur itne sare courses padha rahe hain sab formality kar rahe hain like you said 
को रिडेबिलिटी लर्नेबिलिटी नहीं है तो वो जब तक हम टीचर्स ट्रेनिंग या ट्रेनर्स ट्रेनिंग पे फोकस नहीं करेंगे इंसिडेंटली आज सुबह यहाँ आने से पहले सिंगापुर के पीएम एम यहाँ आए हुए थे दो तो दिन पहले तो हम लोग एक सिंगापुर गवर्नमेंट के साथ में मिलकर वर्ल्ड क्लास स्किल सेंटर चला रहे हैं तो वहाँ की जर्नलिस्ट मुझसे बात कर रही थी उसका बार बार क्वेश्चन ये था आपने सिंगापुर से क्या सीखा मैंने कहा हमने ट्रेनर्स ट्रेनिंग कराया नहीं नहीं सीखा क्या लेकिन हाउ डू आई टेल हर कि हमारी ट्रेनिंग ट्रेनर्स ट्रेनिंग और सिंगापुर से आए हुए मेरे ट्रेनर्स की ट्रेनिंग में कितना अंतर है एंड दैट्स वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्योंकि वो शायद ट्रेनर्स ट्रेनिंग पे हमें बहुत फोकस करना पड़ेगा एंड दैट विल द फ्यूचर विल डिपेंड ऑन दैट वेल दिस इज अ मोस्ट इंटरेस्टिंग सेशन आई एम एब्सोल्युटली लोथ टू एंड इट बट टाइम इज ऑफ द एसेंस एंड सो वी कमिंग टू अ क्लोज टू अ वेरी यूजफुल एंड आई थिंक वेरी इंसाइटफुल डायलॉग I want to thank all my panelists and I want to thank all of you for being engaged and participating so well. Thank you.